Thank you, Cheryl, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, well, uh, the topic is European citizenship and how it changes after Brexit. So as you all know, uh, the UK voted uh, last June to exit the European Union and steps are being taken as we speak to make sure that this occurs uh, in a couple of years. Now, I guess that you might think that this doesn't concern you, but I, I think that on, on several accounts it does. First of all, of course, many American citizens have relatives on the other side of the pond, and the uh, Brexit would entail changes to uh, migration law in Europe in such a way that uh, it will affect all UK nationals and many European citizens. And this can have uh, effects on American citizens as well, their ability to stay, to work, and reunite with family in Europe. Uh, but then there's also other reasons. Uh, so the UK has traditionally been close to the US, uh, especially in, in foreign affairs. So this is a voice that we no longer be speaking within the European Union. Uh, also, Brexit is uh, a metaphor, we could say, for a larger, uh, a more general shift in sensibilities in contemporary politics from multicultural tolerance to uh, populist nationalism, and as such, it should interest us all. Um, now, I, I take it that you're not familiar with all the technical details of this rather unusual form of citizenship, so um, I'll, I'll spend a few uh, moments to describe that, but I'd like to do that uh, through a story. So I wasn't born a European citizen. I became one as the country of my nationality, which is Sweden, entered the European Union. So I hereby joined my fellow citizens in 1995. Most European citizens are like me. We weren't given a birthright. Uh, we became citizens by entering the Union, by choosing to enter the Union. So three years earlier, and this was at Maastricht, uh, European citizenship was created, and the treaty says that every person holding the nationality of a member state shall be a member of, um, a citizen of the Union. The European Court of Justice, um, some years later, insisted on the fact that European citizenship is destined to be the fundamental status of nationals of member states. This is a very avant-garde doctrine, from which the court has never departed. Now, in 1995, I was in my, I was in my late teens, and I was interested in, in, in much more futile things. Uh, so, well, this is me in 1995. Uh, what I thought I had gained then was a special kind of freedom. Freedom from queuing. Now, I had recently moved to Italy, and freedom from queuing meant for me freedom not to queue at the border, freedom not to queue up to get a permit of stay on my uh, residence permit, and uh, well, that was, that was what, you, what first hit me with this uh, new citizenship I had. So it was really a very superficial kind of attitude I had towards it. Uh, having a European passport was essentially freedom from the official harassment that other migrants were subjected to. Then I, I came to learn that I had also been granted a set of other rights, including political rights, and perhaps foremost, the right not to be discriminated, discriminated against on the grounds of nationality. Um, more precisely, the treaty rights include of course, the right to free movement, the right to vote and stand in elections at the local level at the same conditions of the nationals of that state, uh, the political rights for the European level for the European Parliament, the right to consular protection, to petition the European Parliament, the right to appeal to the Ombudsman, the right to good administration, the right to adhere to the citizens' initiative, which is an indirect way of uh, activating uh, uh, the legislature. So it's an indirect way of accessing lawmaking. And uh, the right to address institutions in all official languages. That lost entitlement won't change because English will stay an official language of the Union. Then after this, a host of jurisprudentially developed protection 
um, including the right not to be burdened or discriminated against for having exercised the freedom of movement and moved to another country. Now, these rights have, they come in a bundle and they have a different character, they have a different nature and also a different scope. Uh, but these are the ones that are mostly associated with European citizenship. So, like most other private citizens, um, I was mostly glad to skip to QA. Um, and I think most European citizens on that account are similar to me too. Uh, so today, freedom of movement is one of the most cherished entitlement of European citizens. This is from the last Euro um, barometer, 2016, and indeed, it, it is uh, a very important uh, freedom in the European legal order, it's one of the four key uh, uh, freedoms. Now, it was originally it was originally conceived to be uh, protective of cross-border white-collar workers in the Benelux heartlands. Uh, but as it was framed uh, right of citizens, its personal scope was extended, and it now covers all sorts of people, not only workers. Um, this is of uh, a certain importance here. So today, it covers all European citizens that have health insurance and uh, basic economic means. This isn't everybody, but it's a lot of people. It also covers third country nationals who have a particular situation. So uh, long-term residents, researchers, students, uh, uh, people who move within corporations and the like. So a lot of people are covered by this. After Brexit, Many private citizens around the Union are worried to lose this transnational right to free movement, which is, I would say, the European equivalent of the American doctrine of interstate equality set to protect interstate travel. Now, had I been born with a British passport, I would today be at the risk of losing what has been called the world's first post-national citizenship. Now, in the 90s, people, this, they, they, they hailed European citizenship to be exactly that, so a post-national form of citizenship. And it is an, an, it's a, a very known fact that the use of the suffix post is usually a council of despair, and it turned out to be so in this case too. So no, it is not a post national status. And it is not so because it's precisely the nation states, that's the member states, that get to decide who is European citizen. So the criteria for acquisition and loss of the status are determined at a domestic level. This is very different from what occurs in a federal setting. Mm. It was also uh, very often claimed that this choice of giving European citizenship this derivative character was the smart option in 1992. Um, I'm not sure it was smart, but it was definitely the easy way out. So of course there were other options on the table. Since the 70s, um, some people had been um, trying to construe European citizenship in a way that is similar to uh, the American situation, in which it would be granted on your soil, so uh, by being born on the territory. But the, by, 90, by the 90s, this did not appear to be a political viable option, or so at least it was thought. This was due to the fact that the Berlin Wall had fallen, the uh, migration for the Global South was rising, the number of asylum applications multiplied, ten, multiplied tenfold by the fact that the last uh, genocide on European ground was being consummated in Yugoslavia. <laughs> so making European citizenship derivative uh, was then seen as a solution, but it came at a cost, and I want to be clear about what this cost was. Um, there are today 28 access gates to this status. Um, so the, the member states are free to decide how uh, to give European citizenship. This includes the possibility that in, in, there are, in certain countries you can buy European citizenship without uh, other member states having anything to say about this. So the people who in the 90s claimed that this was a post-national form of citizenship, on one account we're wrong. 
But on another account, they were right. And they were right because, indeed, it is a form of citizenship. It is a status civitatis, as the legal term of art. But what it makes it special is that it's a non-exclusively national form of citizenship. And it is so because it grants entitlements that are supranational and transnational. So they're supranational in the sense that they connect fellow citizens above the border. This is the case, for instance, of the political rights connected to it, or the European Citizenship Initiative that allows uh, to uh, access the lawmakers. But it also grants entitlements that are transnational that, that refer to activities that stretch beyond borders, such as consular protection on one hand or freedom of movement on the other. Uh, but there's a more deep reason or deep-seated reason that, that explains why it's a non-exclusively national form of citizenship. And that is the common principle that holds these entitlements together. That is the freedom from discrimination on the grounds of nationality. So I'll say that again. Freedom from discrimination on the grounds of nationality. Which means that in Europe, uh, nationality is not a relevant criteria to ascribe different rights to people. Whereas in international law, uh, differential treatment on the grounds of nationality is a core feature. It's exactly what we do when we distinguish between nationals and non-nationals, is to allow differential treatment. This is a, a very important in international law. Right? So of course, this is a big difference. But the political bottom line of citizenship is um, similar everywhere. So if the rights of the citizens are only the fruit of a bargain among the elites, or the member states in this case, uh, not enjoying a widespread popular support, the rights of the citizens will remain endangered. So here is where I was youthfully, uh, I, I, in youthful neglect, I was wrong. So as, as citizens, it's important to care for the rights we have as fellow citizens in terms of having a shared interest not merely the rights we have as private citizens where our interests may or may not be compatible. So here's where Brexit enters into the picture. Uh, many European citizens are uh, worried about losing this citizenship today. Uh, many woke up a bit estranged on the morning of um, June 24th. So in the book, I try to understand what would happen to the citizens' rights after Brexit. So what legal resources are available uh, regardless of what would happen in negotiations. So I've opted for a, a view that reads this uh, as if negotiations would fail. And the reason for that is that if we don't know what happens if they fail, it's impossible to say whether they succeed or not. So basically, this is what would happen. No matter what shape, hard or soft, Brexit will eventually take, we know for sure that it will bring changes to the territorial scope of application of the treaties. So this will impact one of the major achievements of European integration, namely the citizen. So it will shrink in size, it will change in composition, and some parts of it will be left in potentially vulnerable situations. This is especially true of those who have relied uh, on free movement in making their life choices. Uh, so many people around uh, Europe are worried about losing rights of residence, being subjected to a different migration status, and potentially ending up illegal migrants, uh, who in many countries are uh, being subjected to administrative detention. Now, this reduction of rights will not only affect British citizens, but also second country nationals. So, uh, Europeans from other member states uh, who live in the UK and their family members, and many times these family members are third country nationals, so uh, non-European citizens. British nationals who are living in other member states will also lose local political rights in 16 member states. And moreover, European citizens are facing a collective and automatic lapse of status. So this means loss of citizenship that occurs en masse 
ex legge, by the automatic workings of the law, uh, that will affect all European citizens of exclusively British nationality. You won't become stateless, of course, and stay British. But it was long uh, argued that European citizenship could only be lost by losing nationality, and Brexit proves that this is wrong. So Article 50 indirectly adds a ground for loss of citizenship. Legally speaking, this loss of citizenship occurs uh, in a non-voluntary way. This is so because it's not fruit of individual renunciation. Right? Now, in the case of Brexit, we, make, we should also make the political claim that it is involuntary because 48% expressed their will to remain, because certain territories voted massively in favor of staying, and because UK citizens residing abroad were effectively disenfranchised. So my first question is, can involuntary loss of citizenship be unilaterally imposed by an exiting state? Now, if we think about it, if the status uh, gives people supranational rights, like supranational political rights, can it then be the case, is it then okay if the authority that is set to take away the status is national and not supranational? or ought it not be located at a supranational level too? Can a national unit, or even a subnational unit, so think about Flanders, Catalonia, Scotland, can a national or subnational unit adjudicate withdrawal of entitlements that are supranational in character? And could the national level do that in a union of which it is no longer part? <coughs> so we can turn this problem around by asking if the authority to take away this status really is national, does this mean that the rights of citizens are not really transnational entitlements but more say like fun mutually recognized privileges? Right? And wouldn't it be strange to say that we enjoy a fundamental status if it can be taken away by your home state after a majority vote. So more practically, I'm interested in understanding whether the loss uh, of citizenship that Brexit will cause can be challenged in court. And now, under international law, and this is not under dispute, a provision that causes people to lose citizenship needs to be challengeable. So it can occur, but it needs to be challengeable. If it's not challenged, then international lawyers will tell you that it will fall within the category of arbitrary uh, loss of citizenship. Now, this is prohibited by a range of international instruments. That would be embarrassing. On the other hand, if we can challenge the loss of citizenship that Brexit will cause, <coughs> before what kind of court would we do that? Before a national court? Before the European Court of Justice? And if we can challenge the loss of citizenship that uh, Brexit entails before the European Court of, of Justice, would that mean that Article 50 loses its meaning? So the ECJ uh, has a tradition of being very active when it comes to citizenship. And there's a particular case that refers to loss of union citizenship. This is the Rockman case. Now, in the Rockman case, a man uh, ended up being stateless. He was born uh, with um, Austrian citizenship. He renounced that to become German. Uh, the German authorities um, understood that he had lied in his application, and they uh, lapsed his newly acquired German citizenship with the effect of leaving him stateless. This case went before the ECJ, and the ECJ uh, said that it was not okay by reason of its nature and consequences to deprive a European citizen of his European citizenship. So it particularly refers to this. And by all measures, Brexit would, uh, by reason of its nature and consequences, and I'm quoting the court here, place many in a position capable of causing them to lose the status. Indeed. So could the ECJ somehow tell the UK that they're wrong? Would this, would this make sense? Uh, and wouldn't that frustrate the will of Brexiters to leave? 
Now, once you acknowledge that British nationals will lose European citizenship and the connected rights, will, with Brexit, I think, comes what I would like to describe as a constitutional dilemma, right? So, must we say, on one hand, must we say that the transnational rights that constitute European citizenship cannot be erased at will by an existing state? So rights exercised under, under EU law would actually outlive the legal provisions that created them. Now, legally speaking, this is like Frankenstein. It's a lie. Right? <laughs> so you wouldn't want to have a situation like that. On the other hand, however, must we say that the rights of union citizens may very well be surprised if your home state decides to exit? So union citizenship on that reading wouldn't at all be the fundamental status that the European Court of Justice speaks of. It wouldn't even be protective of pretty basic things, such as staying to live where you actually built your life. On that reading, it's more like a little conditional gift, not a right at all. So if rights are maintained, do you want to sacrifice the will of the people to exit on the altar of individual rights? Or do you prefer to sacrifice the rights of European citizens on the altar of, self, uh, of democratic self-determination? British self-determination, that would be. Now, I think that this is a real constitutional dilemma. Some commentators that have been looking at this even claim that extending um, <coughs> protection of EU treaty rights to a people who just voted to leave the Union would be nothing less than a coup d'etat. So that would go into revolutionary measures. Now I think that the reason why we end up in this mess is because people tend to reason with the instruments of convention. And conventional wisdom has it that entitlements vanish when criteria for access are no longer fulfilled. So this means, in this context, that no treaty rights can be given to former European citizens, right? So Brits living in the Union, it's bye-bye to freedom of movement. And on the other hand, it means that no, <coughs> I'm sorry, no treaty rights uh, can be uh, recognized beyond the scope of application of the treaties. And this means for all European citizens who wish to continue living in the UK, good luck with that. I don't buy this story. I don't think it makes for any good policy suggestions. And it doesn't allow us to confront the dilemma. So let's hear it for <coughs> the philosopher's view on this. <coughs> I think that a better way to address this uh, situation or this issue is by applying what I've called the functionalist theory of citizenship, which is the one I advocate in the book. It's in chapter four, You're, it's available uh, in open access, so feel free to download. Now, what I'd like to stress is that this is not a theory about conceptions of citizenship, but it is a theory about the concept of citizenship. So you don't need to buy any particularly thick or substantive ideas about uh, political legitimacy or identity in order to use this theory. You can be a nationalist, you can be a cosmopolitan. You can define inclusive or exclusive forms of citizenship. It doesn't matter because the theory is agnostic to conceptions. <coughs> I'm sorry. So what I've got to say about uh, citizenship here is true for any instance of status civitatis across time and across space. So uh, this is true also for for uh, forms of citizenship that are rhetorical or putative or symbolic, right? The functionalist theory will, will submit that citizenship is essentially a middle term. And this is something I take from uh, Scandinavian legal realism. But, 
Okay, so what does that mean? It means that if we take it to be a little term, it's similar to a conceptual bridge, I would say. Uh, what it does is that it links two aspects. So on the one hand, you will find criteria for acquisition and loss of citizenship, your sanguinis, your soli, and other criteria that define uh, access to citizenship, your specunia, your sonorarium, and so on. And on the other hand, you will find the entitlements, the personal scope of which coincide with the citizens. So this can include the right to vote, uh, the right to be protected against deportation, the right to abode, etc. These entitlements also vary across time and space. They are, of course, not the same in the Roman Empire as they are in the US today. But still, so many have drawn the conclusion that since both fluctuate, there's no point in searching for common ground. There's no point in searching for a concept of citizenship. Uh, and I think that that is where they're wrong. So they do not fluctuate indefinitely. <coughs> uh, there is intelligibility here. So we can understand the way they fluctuate. Uh, and I think it can be expressed with a mathematical function. <coughs> so when you travel, Air conditioning, not just it. <laughs> so uh, it's a surjective function on uh, that basically what it does is that it connects the criteria for access and loss of citizenship with a set of entitlements to which it is connected. Right. Now any form of citizenship, I would argue, does this, so connects a set of entitlements with a set of uh, criteria for accessing the status. And this is precisely what status quitatis, what citizenship always does, right? So this is kind of to say it's the job of citizenship. It gets to say who does what as citizens. And this job is done by union citizenship too. So on that account, it is quite similar. European citizenship is quite similar to national citizenships. So both connect criteria determining uh, acquisition and loss of the status with a set of entitlements. Like, like any job, you can do it well or less well. So the functionalist theory would also give you a way to test how well a um, given citizenship policy actually works. You can test it on its internal coherence. So I would submit that the legitimacy would depend on how well the criteria for loss actually fit the entitlement. Okay, so getting back to Brexit, how can we use this? The question is, is the loss of European citizenship for British nationals legitimate or not? <coughs> now we know that it will depend <laughs> it will depend on the entitlements, right? And as we've seen, the entitlements come in a bundle uh, that include rights of a different character. So they include special privileges of an intergovernmental character, such as consular protection. But they also include um, supranational political rights, such as the Citizens' Initiative. Right? So my answer to the question of whether this is legitimate or not would be the typical lawyerish answer. It depends, right? So <laughs> in so far as uh, union citizenship gives us uh, special privileges, your home state is free to strip you of that status. So on that account, the the, the way uh, Brexit will entail loss of European citizenship is legitimate. But insofar as it gives you supranational political rights, your home state is not free to strip you of a status that gives you this. So losing a European citizenship the way Brexit uh, will cause is not legitimate. So if we concentrate on that for all, I will submit that a former member state 
may not erase supranational entitlements in a union of which it is no longer part. But if this is true, then there has to be a way to save the status. And indeed, it looks like there are several ways. So one possibility is, of course, to use the European Court of Justice. There is a slight possibility that the court will be involved to save the status, in which it can rely on the Rotman Doctrine. So consider the case of a British citizen who is living in another member state and who holds local political office there on the grounds of being a union citizen. Now, following Brexit, he or she would be discharged from office. So a national court, because this is the Tribunal Supremo in Spain, a national court may refer in a preliminary ruling to the European Court of Justice. And were the ECJ to express itself in a preliminary ruling on the loss of the status as such, then the Rotman's Razzo de Cidelli would apply. Right. So saving uh, the status by appealing to the ECJ indeed is possible. But I will also argue that it's pretty unappealing. Consider a uh, British first country national, so uh, in the UK, who challenges the loss of status before a UK court. This has to occur before uh, the exit actually takes, um, uh, actually happens, so before 2019. But before 2019, uh, indeed, the British court would be in a position to refer back to the European Court of Justice. Now, that first country national, that, that person going to the UK court, would not be denied right of standing. And even though politically remote, it is possible for the court to refer to the ECJ. And if the ECJ comes into the picture, then it could rely on the Rotman Doctrine, and the ECJ could then push for decoupling between citizenship and nationality. But I think that this could only occur at very serious cost. Because if decoupling derives from an ECJ decision, it can and will be attacked on democratic grounds and accused of jeopardizing the constitutional order. So making the ECJ save the status by decoupling uh, might be possible, but I would argue that it's not very attractive. Another solution is, of course, to let the member states do something. And they are in a better position, I think, uh, to save the situation, at least, of some British nationals that will be uh, caught up in this situation. They can freeze rights. Uh, they can ease naturalization. They can help the passage to uh, third country national long-term residents. They can do several things. But there's one thing they can't do, and that's naturalize in mass. And surprisingly, this has been suggested by several senior politicians. However, it would violate the principle of sincere cooperation within the union. So that's one thing they can't do. However, they could do it if they are coordinated. So that would require coordination within the council. But there's a better way still. And that is, of course, to get the help of the citizens themselves. So there's a possibility for the citizens to enact their citizenship in this context. Uh, that is by activating a citizen's initiative or by petitioning parliament. Neither immediately uh, uh, produces decoupling, but both of them uh, are ways that are open to, um, to push for enactment of the citizenry in that direction. And the fancy detail here is that you can save the status this way even after Brexit occurs, especially in reference to the European Parliament here. Because all the residents have the uh, right to petition Parliament, and we have reason to believe that British citizens uh, will see their residence rights frozen in the European Union because of EU law on one hand and international law on the other. So this would be the case even after Brexit occurs. The political legitimacy of this kind of decoupling would rely on the fact that this is the first time that union citizens are, uh, that were given the, the, the status as Maastricht, um, raise their voice to say they want to remain 
uh, citizens, which is different from saying that they want to become citizens. So my conclusion is, do we need to, to choose, like it has been suggested, between European citizenship on one hand and Article 50 on the other? Well, I don't think we, we, we need to make that choice. Uh, I think it's a misconception because of the notion of citizenship used, that is either too vague or too slippery. So I think having a clear concept of citizenship helps us to see that on the one hand, we do not need to sacrifice union citizenship rights in order to allow Brexit, because supranational rights can be vindicated by the citizenry without going outside the constitutional context. And we don't need to sacrifice the meaning of Article 50 in order to save the rights of residents. Because even if you do lose European citizenship, the European Convention of Human Rights uh, will step in and protect the right of, to stay of all legal residents. So that will include all British nationals. Perhaps this can be harder to enforce in the UK, uh, but there are uh, reasons to believe that also their rights of residence will be frozen on the basis of the Coolidge Doctrine from the Strasbourg Court. Now this will disappoint many, I think most. So lovers of EU law, uh, they will be disappointed because the most cherished of entitlements of European citizens will need to be saved by an obscure doctrine of international law. And on the other hand, I think that Brexiteers or Brexiters will surely be suspicious of the fact that uh, you can hold on to rights uh, commonly associated with union citizenship even though you are no longer citizens. So I think that they will understand this to be something like the Hotel California Doctrine, the one according to which you can check out any time, but you can never leave. Is this true? No, it isn't, because uh, there's a big difference here between keeping the uh, entitlements that are associated with citizenship and extending the, the scope of EU law to exiting territories. This is a very important point here. So basically, my reading of this problem is that you are free to leave. You're just not free to bring the house down as you slam the door. Thank you. Thank you. That was very lively. So I see we also have a range of people here, including from the European Studies, uh, European Union Study Center, as well as some philosophers. The, I forgot to mention that they're co sponsor of the talk, so I wanted to acknowledge that. And I call on you for questions. Alex. Hi, thanks so much for coming and giving the talk. It's very interesting, especially for an American philosophy student that definitely doesn't know anything about the inner workings of the EU. But I'm worried in your solution about a free rider problem coming up. Um, insofar as if the people can retain their EU related rights, but the national entity can leave, and the EU laws won't apply there, does that sort of give some incentive to other EU countries who might like the idea of keeping their rights, being able to move about and all that, but also might like the idea of not having EU law on their territory? So maybe that's a really ignorant question. <laughs> no, it maybe it's no, I think it's a very good question. And indeed, there is a possibility, I won't deny this, there is a possibility that if uh, what you're really interested in is merely your right as a private citizen to move about, uh, and in this case, uh, the right to residence, because that is the key thing that would be maintained, um, then indeed it would open up that kind of scenario. Uh, but I would also argue that these rights, uh, the rights of the European citizens, come in a bundle, right? And you can't disbundle them. Uh, so they are also inclusive of um, rights of a different character that are not pertaining to you as a private citizen, but as a fellow citizen of the Union. Those are rights that will be lost, right? So I think that at stake is really a question of solidarity among fellow citizens as political partakers in a project. Uh, those are not rights that would be maintained by appealing to um, the European Convention of Human Rights. However, I think that the 
European Convention of Human Rights is sufficiently strong as to um, guarantee the possibility uh, for European citizens not to become illegal migrants overnight. So that would be my answer. Um, yes. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm Jessica Lee. Subject is fascinating and at the same time very vibrant and important. So um, you have uh, explained very well and given some solutions. So uh, from my point of view, I feel that um, it's 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 going to be very difficult that some rights are going to be consolidated for uh, people living in the UK, either born in, in the UK or like residents, permanent residents, and working there. Of course, this is uh, an assumption that. Uh, it's like very general, but I'm sure that in your work, maybe, and all this explanation could uh, uh, support this argument, you know, like some rights, if they have been acquired through many years and people are living there, I don't know until what point it's gonna be, we're gonna be able to take them out. Then also, uh, it's interesting, interesting to me to consider what's gonna happen with, uh, with us. I mean, I'm from Europe, <laughs> sorry, like the same like you. Uh, like, European um, European citizens wanting to go into the UK and um, yes for visit you know like so we have to go to immigration and or even to, to stay there to find a job so I don't know whether we're going to be treated exactly as you know like any other I don't want to say any other country but because I don't want to make a comparison a negative comparison but it should be also interesting that it's if this is all going to be a legal negotiation about rights, and I think it's going to be very strong, but I don't know after like so many years and being Europeans whether we should have the same status from like some other <coughs> person living somewhere else. Maybe it's fair, you know, I don't know. And then at the same time, it's the other way around. I think that you mentioned also that it's uh, what's going to happen with, uh, with the British people living in Europe, in Germany, in Spain, like, I mean, like, I live in, I'm from Spain. So, um, yeah, I have uh, uh, British, British uh, neighbors that have a house by the seaside where my parents have a house, and they spend part of the year there. So, maybe the theory, well, I don't know what's going to happen, maybe the theory is going to be very distinct, but what if they need something while they're going to be there? Like, of course, there's the embassies, or, but sometimes, you know, you need something which is going to be like more uh, easy or fast, you know what I mean? So, are they going to lose all those rights if they need some legal uh, or some other? We could think about different situations, considering the, uh, the entitlements of European citizens. And finally, it has to do with, the, with his question. It's uh, about um, uh, transformative citizenship through uh, European, through the cards. You know, and I, I don't know too well because I think this is very. Uh, very big, you know, so we need to, to have a look at the European Court of Justice, Supreme Court, ordinary courts. But I feel that uh, there's going to be a, a path, the same that it's happening with some other areas, not just European law, like what can be happening also here in the US, the role of the performance of the, of the courts, you know, like with se several executive orders, you know. So to me, that's a very interesting uh, uh, path to, to explore because we always have the right to appeal our thoughts. And um, I think that should be very interesting. I don't know about your okay. point. I think Sorry. Better <laughs> answer. It was a long sentence. Okay, so those were several questions. Let me start by the first one. <clears throat> Acquired rights. So one of the key issues that the negotiations will need to deal with is what would happen uh, to the uh, European citizens that are currently living in, um, in the UK. Will there be a cut-off date? Will that cut-off date be the Brexit referendum? Will it be the exit date? Will people have needed to mature their rights when this cut-off date uh, happens? Will there be like a sunset clause that will allow people who have started to mature their rights for, for indefinite leave to remain to actually finish that, etc.? We don't know this. But what, what is clear, and what we can say right now, is that it uh, <laughs> Uh, it is reasonable, even though it will be not uh, clear what kind of enforcement we'll be looking at. 
but it is possible at least uh, that the Coors Doctrine from the Strasbourg Court will allow people to have uh, their residence rights frozen even though they will not have those residence rights on the grounds of their nationality. Right? Could you explain the Coors? So the, the case is this. Um, um, it was a case of erased people in Slovenia that followed the, the, the independence of the, the public. Uh, and we were dealing with uh, about 1% um, of the population. Uh, after a long saga in the, in the Slovenian courts, it eventually ended up before the uh, European Courts of Human Rights. And then it was decided that these people who had been uh, deprived of uh, rights also relating to residents, due to the fact that they no longer held the nationality of the country, that is Slovenia, even though they had held previously the right to stay there as uh, citizens of Yugoslavia, right, because they held the nationality of another uh, member state of Yugoslavia. Uh, these people or could not uh, be uh, erased from the civic registers as they had been. Right? So this is a very interesting case because it's pretty similar. And it will probably uh, give the grounds to, to the claim. I mean, it will allow us to claim that people who have matured permanent residency in the UK by whatever cutoff date that would, would be set uh, can stay. Right? So that's really enough something to but it will not allow uh, future migration, right? So it will not allow for people who have not yet uh, entered the UK and would wish to do that. That is particularly of importance for uh, family members because family reunification will probably uh, be much more difficult after Brexit. Then there was a question about those uh, British nationals who are, for instance, living in Spain. Uh, that is 106,000 people, uh, mostly are retired, uh, or, well, I'll be specific about it. 106,000 individuals are currently taking out their, their retirement in Spain, having UK nationality. Uh, they will have as an expert. <laughs> they will have a, they will have a different situation, of course. So, uh, but they will not uh, lose residence rights, nor will they be transformed into illegal migrants overnight. And the reason being that they will stay within the European legal order. So, besides uh, the the limits that we have from the, the Strasbourg Court, from the European uh, right, uh, Court of Human Rights, you will have a host of other. Uh, uh, European law-related limits to what can be done with these individuals. But there are other things that will happen, so they will not see an, an automatic increase in their retirement as is currently the case. So those things will change. Uh, and there was a fourth question. Yeah, need health that the insurance. They need to buy health insurance. They? If they would need to buy health insurance. Yeah, for their insurance. Ah, yes. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, they would be set in a position as third country nationals, but <clears throat> notice that they would be considered uh, third country nationals with uh, uh, permanent residence. So in a position much, much more similar to that of a European citizen. Notice that the two directives of European citizenship and being a third country national with a uh, long permit of stay in Europe are virtually the same. So uh, you need to have stayed five years, you know, et cetera, et cetera. What really makes the difference is that if you're a third country national uh, applying for uh, uh, a permanent residence in Europe, you will be subjected to integration tests. So these are tests testing language, um, understanding of culture, et cetera. <coughs> Now I want to be clear about this point because these integration tests have become more and more popular, uh, but they're also very hard to pass. So, uh, for instance, uh, two thirds flopped the Danish integration test last year, and it included a question that was, which is the Danish restaurant that has uh, two Michelin stars? And uh, if anybody of you thinks that that is Noma, you're wrong. 
So, so uh, it can include very, very, very tricky questions. Um, you should give it to the Danish citizens and see how they do. Yeah, probably not. It's not going to be 100%. <laughs> I don't know about this. Yeah. 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 But one thing that I find interesting about this is Spain. So Spain, in 2015, introduced the integration test. They didn't previously have it. So the, the English people who are living there and who would eventually like to, to stay, they would need to pass uh, this form of, of linguistic and, and social tests. Right. And it's not obvious that they would, they would pass. Uh, and I think that one of the things that the member states can do and ought to do, and it's really easy to do, is to waive the integration test for British nationals who want to stay. Interesting. How we hear from a British national? Uh, so a, a lot of the analysis okay. in the UK has been about the question of um, whether the, 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 the EU or, or what remains of the EU, whether the EU um, is sort of incentivized to preserve some of the rights you've been talking about, or whether in fact um, what's in the interest of the EU um, is to make this, make the process of leaving as difficult and as uh, It's a, it's a, it's a troublesome or, or strip as many rights as possible from, from, from leaving EU says, uh, leaving UK citizens um, in order to prevent you know similar uh, exits from the EU further down the line from, from, from other countries that have like strong sort of national tendencies. Um, I I wondered what your prediction would be about how how, how much of a role that incentive would, would, would play the incentive to make this quite difficult or, uh, or, or to remove quite a lot of rights in order to make it less likely that other countries will have a similar sort of uh, nationalist movement and also um, if you felt like that would be constitutionally justified. Okay, so indeed there's been lots of talk about, about how Europe would punish the UK. <coughs> Uh, and there's also been lots of talk from, um, from prominent uh, um, uh, politicians uh, on, within the European Union uh, handing out the, the olive branch, so to say, saying that we would, in an act of generosity, uh, not uh, punish the UK. And I think that in order to, to address this question, we really need to know what would happen if the negotiations fail. Because only then can we judge whether these acts of generosity really are such or not. In particular, I would like to recall uh, the statement that has been um, done by, by Fair Hofstadter, so the, the uh, Brexit chief of the European Parliament, that in the beginning of March said that uh, uh, in an act of generosity, uh, British uh, nationals in the EU would be allowed to stay. Now, this is not an act of generosity. This is the law. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think this is the reason why we need to make this kind of analysis, because otherwise we're unable to say, <laughs> or we're unable to access the kind of information we get. Um, another thing that I would like to, to underline in, in that uh, uh, regard is that the numbers we've been speaking about are uh, unprecise. Um, it has been repeated systematically, and still is, by very serious media also, that the number of uh, second country nationals in the UK would amount to 3 million, 3.3 million, I've read sometimes, uh, and that uh, British nationals in, um, in the other member states would be 1.2 million. These data, uh, sometimes are, they're just they just refer to. But when you look for it seriously, you will find that the source most commonly used is human data. But the human data records uh, country of birth, so not citizenship. There's, uh, there is, you can be born in another country and still have British citizenship. And of course, you can gain citizenship in other countries um, by, uh, by living there or by being born on the territory. So, if we look at more serious figures that have been uh, that have been calculated, 
we're not talking about these dimensions. We're talking about something that is closer to 2.9 million second country nationals in the UK and about 690,000 British nationals in the Union. Um, is there a risk that, the, I, can you repeat the part on the, the constitutional impact of the, you were saying something about the constitutional I, I, I wondered if, if you felt that, um, that, this idea of make, making it difficult or, 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 or making it as harrowing as possible to, to have to unpack as, as many rights as possible uh, in order to prevent future uh, Brexits or, or things similar. Uh, I wonder if, if you thought it was likely to play a role, and I wonder if you, what your your feelings are normatively about that is. Do, 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 you, do you think that that's uh, justified relative to, to, to preserving the EU? So I think that one one serious political issue we'll be looking at <coughs> that is related to Scotland has to do with devolved uh, constituencies within member states. So I'm um, um, particularly. Uh, thinking about Scotland, Flanders, and Catalonia. Uh, it has been stressed many times over that uh, there would be this, this doctrine according to which uh, if a devolved constituency declares independence, that constituency would not fall under EU law. Right? So this is a very often repeated claim. In this situation, this complicates a lot uh, how the these eventual independence cases would be dealt with because it is, we can't exclude that you would have a situation in which uh, if Scotland separates from or exits the UK, so to say, it would still stay in the EU, right? So that would definitely uh, complicate matters uh, very, very seriously. What that would mean for uh, European citizens on, uh, in relation to nationality matters is also a big issue. And I think that the, the closest cases we'll be looking at then comes from the decolonization era. We would look at state succession scenarios. What I think normatively is the case uh, is that this is a pretty depressing situation we're looking at. Uh, and uh, I see very few signs uh, of, um, let's say, solidarity among European citizens to uh, care for their common polity. Uh, what I do see is much more umbilical uh, nationalism, perhaps as a reaction to how things have been uh, governed uh, in relation to other aspects of living together. But I don't see this looking any brighter. So. Yeah, um, you said a lot So in your talk, and I'm certainly didn't follow it all. Um, I'll have to read what you said. But early on, you said that the question was whether an involuntary loss of citizenship can be unilaterally imposed um, by an existing state. But I don't see that as a problem, because states can regularly do that to their own citizens. They can have granted somebody citizenship and then find out, let's say, that they had said something dishonest and therefore taken away. So we grant that for their own citizens. Why not for the EU? And also, in what sense is it, you know, one could argue, well, it's not quite involuntary because they agreed to the procedure by which Brexit would be decided and therefore indirectly it was a voluntary decision. Okay, so when I speak about involuntary loss of citizenship, I'm referring to the modality of loss, not the will of the right holder, right? So legally speaking, we would call uh, involuntary loss uh, a loss that does not occur as a fruit of renunciation, right? So if an individual renounces to his or her citizenship, that would fit the category of voluntary. And if you have a lapse of status or a collective loss of status, as this is the case, it would, it's not fruit of individual renunciation, so it would fall into involuntary, right? Uh, the reason why international law has been conceived that way when it concerns citizenship 
is the fact that it is possible for uh, states to denationalize citizens. There's a limit to what they can do there because you can't create stateless, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't denationalize randomly, uh, but you can do that for certain individuals in certain conditions. Uh, and that is commonly practiced. It's actually practiced more often today than it used to be uh, just a decade ago. However, it's one thing to denationalize an individual and another thing to collectively take away status for whole groups of people. So the situation that is regulated in international law is lapse of status. So a state cannot take away citizenship for whole groups of people within the state. This is uh, relative to the fact that the state has a duty to care for the people on its territory. Uh, so it is, uh, historically speaking, this is linked to uh, uh, the Third Reich uh, taking away citizenship from Jews. So the historical background to why international law is regulated this way is this. So it really makes a difference whether uh, it is taken away for an individual or for a group. I would say that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know if it works, but it's an interesting move. <laughs> uh, thank you for your talk. It seems to me that most of your reasoning and the rubrics that you are using to present these arguments are based in constitutional law. I, I wonder if you've ever looked at any of this through the lens of contract law and that the individual people that might have begun to act as a course of dealing, for example, moving to Britain under the basis of this implied contract, or actually a real contract, of being part of this union, and have begun lives that, on the basis of that agreement, that this is actually a breach of contract by Britain, and that therefore the remedies of the people who have based their actions on this contract need to be restituted, or perhaps as individuals have their rights retained or restored, even if the next generation of people do not. And I wonder if remedy under contract might be a solution set that is outside of constitutional argument, but still might be practical in this region. That's a very interesting perspective, so thank you very much for that question. Now, uh, I would say that most of the, the arguments I'm making is about public, yeah, public mm -hmm. law, broadly speaking, or international private law, but that kind of area of law. Uh, that idea of the fact that the people would have acquired rights uh, or vested rights in a certain sense uh, that would allow them also to go to court on, on this basis was uh, uh, brought up uh, early on after the referendum and has been tested to some extent at least uh, in the debate by scholars uh, and uh, also discussed in, in legal fora. Um, it does not currently at least in, in this as far as I know, has not brought on any, any real uh, legal challenges. So uh, it has not been brought before a court to be tested. The argument there is really about the Vienna Convention of what acquired rights mean, means in that context. And it seems like the most probable interpretation we have is that the Vienna Convention would cover uh, acquired rights, yes, but that those acquired rights are to be understood as rights you have really as a private citizen. So it's things like property, uh, those kind of relations would be covered uh, and you could probably go to court on that. So if it was the case that the British government would somehow uh, deprive European citizens of, of uh, real estate acquired or something like that, then that would come into the picture. But it's not currently part of the picture because the, the positions or the legal positions that uh, are being called into question are of a public nature. I would say that's the answer. I'm just looking at it as a solution set for saying if behavior was induced by reliance on an agreement and that agreement is unilaterally breached, the, there is a cause for restitution and protection of those who relied on that agreement to start with. That is universal in every <laughs> system. Right? Yes, yes. So it's not usually applied cross border, it's usually applied to individuals, but perhaps this is, you know, additional lens that would at least for the 106,000 Brits that are on the <laughs> Spanish coast would give them an argument for uh, not losing the rights that they had the life on. I would think more about that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Okay. 
let me just uh, ask mine. Um, as a clarification, I'm, uh, you earlier said that people gained their, that the uh, relation of the union to its member states is distinctive, or citizenship is distinctive in that um, they get it, they got it originally by virtue of their nations, I mean, of their states' accession to the, or joining the union. Doesn't that kind of undercut your argument in some ways in the sense that you, you're now trying to, um, uh, wouldn't it suggest that if it, the commensurately that if, this, if, a mem if a previous member state decides to leave that in a parallel way that one would lose those rights? Whereas you're trying to argue that, uh, you know, that they gain rights by virtue of being uh, in this union itself. So what would you, how would you address a criticism from that standpoint that the parallelism would suggest uh, a different direction from what you're arguing, that, they should, that it's legitimate for them to just lose their citizenship rights? Okay, so, so on, on one hand, it really looks like this. So Article 50, that is about exiting the union, can be seen as an indirect uh, ground for losing citizenship. The same way as Article 49 that regulates accession to the Union uh, would add a ground for acquiring citizenship. So they really look like they're mirror images. And also but the thing historically, is, is it, it was the case that you gained it, as you said in, in the beginning yes. of this talk, from, um, by, by, the next, by the state joining. But this is true for all states that are not part of the states that um, uh, created the, the Maastricht Treaty. Because in that case, we're dealing with a different kind of scenario. So in that case, the, we're speaking about states that, uh, uh, that come together, make an international treaties with the purpose of creating a status that will be uh, trans, supra, or post-national. Right? So at least in those uh, cases, you cannot make the argument that as you come in, you leave. That would be my answer. Uh, thank you very much for a very uh, interesting presentation. Uh, you mentioned among the uh, rights that citizen, uh, citizens acquire by joining the EU is uh, the possibility of bringing about a citizen's initiative. And that reminded me of uh, a group called One of Us about two or three years ago. They had gathered close to two million signatures and uh, they presented it, I don't know, to the European Parliament or whatever, and it was just totally ignored. Can you reflect some light on, you know, the reasoning behind the whole thing? Yes. Thank you. So, of course, uh, signing and uh, getting uh, uh, European citizens' initiative is not uh, equivalent. It doesn't amount to uh, initiating lawmaking. Right? The only thing it does is to call on the Commission to take into consideration what the, the initiative uh, is about. Right? So this is really a kind of the political dimension of the otherwise legal argument. So um, if citizens uh, would push for a decoupling between citizenship and nationality, it is not, as if, it's not the same political situation as if the court would do it. Right? So, here we would be placed before a situation in which it would be much harder for the Commission not to take in consideration the claims made. Right? So many of the uh, initiatives that have been, been signed and that went through the whole process uh, did not end up in, in any lawmaking. Right? So there's, there's a possibility of total flop there. Right? Uh, but it's still the case that there's some, some in the political setting is such that it would be very, very hard to avoid uh, answering that kind of, uh, of call. Uh, the same goes for petitioning the European Parliament. Petitioning the Parliament does not mean that the Parliament will actually act upon that petition, but it does mean that it's kind of pushed into taking this up to its agenda. Uh, and in the case of the European Parliament, there is also something that pertains to the Parliament's self-understanding that leads us to think that um, uh, they might not uh, discourage uh, a decoupling. 
I mean, it has to do with the fact that uh, the parliament on several occasions has made the, the argument that it doesn't represent the peoples of Europe, but it represents the population of Europe. Uh, if that is true, that would be a step in the direction of thinking that, yes, they would probably listen seriously to a petition about decoupling. So that would be the kind of political setting. But yes, of course, there's a serious risk of a total flop. Let me just uh, just to follow up. What would be some of the and then, and then, what would be some of the implications of the decoupling? Anything beyond what you have said here? Would you gain new rights? Uh, what do you mean <coughs> exactly by it? Okay, so uh, two things here that I think are very important. Uh, initially, when European citizenship was was, was conceived. Uh, there was some discussion about whether uh, this should be granted to only nationals of member states or to all people living in the Union. Right? Uh, the second option was discarded. Right? Uh, that would have covered third country nationals uh, living in the Union. Right? That was discarded. Right? Uh, this is of some importance because now we have a serious mismatch between the peoples of Europe or those having the nationality of member states and the population that is much vaster than um, the people have a nationality, right? So in that setting, uh, what the issue was about was the role, the political role of third country nationals in the setting. But decoupling in the Brexit situation is a little bit different because it's not about third country nationals' political rights, but it's about safeguarding rights that are held by these British nationals currently. So it's a little bit different, and that also means that there is more, I mean, it's more probable that, uh, that both the uh, Parliament and the Commission might have a more, um, a less suspicious look on. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm wondering if a consequence of your argument is that there's something politically illegitimate about the European Union and its laws in that, or articles, in that Article 50 would seem is an illegitimate principle, because anybody who's arguing, act, any state that's acting at it is denying these rights, which they should not. And then the whole EU is a mess. Okay. Yes. And so what the implication is you can never, no state can ever choose to leave the EU. It has to, once it's there, it's there involuntarily forever. Okay, so two things about that. I think that to a certain extent, uh, the punto dolens is really Article 50, right? So it was introduced um, um, uh, kind of in a way to save the, the, the treaty, uh, but uh, not really uh, thinking that it would be used by a country like the UK, right? So the idea is that, that kind of um, informs the, the current uh, formulation of the article is more to make sure that the EU wouldn't uh, withhold the country from exiting, right? So that is how it has been conceived. Then I would also like to point out that historically speaking, in, in comparative constitutional perspective, uh, uh, these kinds of rights in which you have a political union and there's a right saying that you can exit, and there's an article saying that you can exit, is um, common in illiberal settings. So um, you can find it in, in certain uh, liberal settings, but it's extremely rare in other forms of settings. So it kind of clashes with some of the principles of this legal order. So yes, uh, there's some, I mean, there's some issue here going on that would need clarification. Uh, but still, I would argue that it is possible to exit the union. It's just not possible to exit the union in whatsoever way. So, um, for instance, uh, it would be needed to be done in a way that respects uh, certain um, general principles of the European legal order. And that includes uh, principle of legitimate expectation, so you could not, in that case, for instance, make the cut-up date for acquiring rights Brexit referenda, which would make uh, uh, 
the legal situation of these people be invalidated retrospectively, for instance, that could not be the case. Uh, there's, I mean, this principle of sincere cooperation. There's a set of principles that kind of limits what can be done in a situation of exit that have not really been the object of uh, um, of great interest until this Brexit situation came along. Right? So I think there's some work can be done there. Uh, and I would like to point out one thing that I think might be interesting in this Brexit situation, referring to that. So since migration has really been kind of the focus of the political debate surrounding Brexit, it's not, um, it's not uh, um, bizarre to imagine a situation in which uh, the UK would like to change its nationality law, right? uh, perhaps making it more stringent, perhaps picking and choosing which uh, European citizens it wants, and these kind of situations. Now, an interesting fact about uh, how Article 50 works is that the UK would effectively be limited in its ability to, choose, to change its own nationality law. Right? So, nationality law is, is uh, normally conceived of as domaine uh, réservé, uh, as something that only the member states can, can, can change. But in a case like this, it would turn out to be uh, very difficult for the UK to make its nationality law or its migration law uh, tougher without incurring in sanctions from the Commission and the ECJ. So I think we're looking at a situation in which a competence that previously was within uh, the realm of the member state, because of Article 50, really isn't the member state. Now, on that provocative note, uh, please, we can just adjourn to our reception. And please join me in thanking um, Patricia for a wonderful Thank you.